Yes, your refrigerator is trying to kill you. I get to talk about fun things like botulism today. If you have ever wanted to know how to give someone botulism in the most Rube Goldberg-esque manner, go to lunch with a security researcher after the announcement of a major CVE. As someone who isn't a security researcher but does have invested interest in security, it is always an utterly amazing, fascinating lunchtime conversation that you look at your lunch a little differently after. Hack their router, get access to their wireless lighting system, so, they go to, so now you know when they go to bed and when they wake up. Hack their fridge for either an unpatched vulnerability or if their upgrade process is poorly designed, pollute their firmware with your own. Turn off the fridge when they go to sleep, turn it on just before they wake back up, and then they will never know that you're slowly spoiling their food. <laughs> Actual conversation I had. Is it a silly little thought experiment? Of course it is. But are vulnerabilities in unupgraded embedded devices something we really need to worry about? As more and more specific purpose devices, devices become prevalent? Certainly. Right after the announcement of Heartbleed, I couldn't stop thinking about security within the embedded space. I had been looking at a lot of the popular press that was going on back then and what they were reporting, which websites were affected, who was already patched, what passwords did I need to change, and was my bank safe. And with a few notable exceptions, not many people were talking about the security issues that were really keeping me up at night. Are my anti-lock brakes safe? My cable modem? The electrical grid? What about FDA devices, heart monitors, pacemakers? What happens when we have something like Heartbleed and we have to deal with it in the embedded and IoT space? And why do people consider embedded devices as Im or not as important as an e-commerce site? Is there really a problem here or is this just FUD? And if there is a problem, what is it and how, what can we do about it? So embedded devices are hardly new. Specific purpose computing devices are as old as the Apollo program. Many of us who are in the embedded space world, we kind of dipped our toes in it via programmable ICs, making small purposely built, rarely connected devices that do a single thing. And this is part of our problem. Embedded has changed so drastically from the small, dumb devices that we have needed to change the very nature of how we think about it, about what we do in some very fundamental ways. Embedded devices are no longer just an IC and a little bit of few, few components, but are now full compute devices with complex OS, sta OS stacks and connectivity. Embedded developers have needed to become systems engineers. We've needed to put a higher priority on security, OS design, and the processes by which we do field upgrades. And I want to talk about field upgrades. <sighs> We need to acknowledge that sometimes in the embedded world, very little upgrading occurs. Part of this is how embedded once was. Field upgrades would happen maybe once a year, maybe. Um, but as the way we think about embedded devices becomes more and more similar to how we think about things like web servers, we need to change how we actually think about this. We can no longer rely on the once a year field technician going out to do an upgrade. Um, there are devices out there now who are already doing this, and they are already upgrading frequently, and they're implementing full upgrade schemes with failover partitions to traditional package management, and we can, need to continue this work. So as much as I like talking about things like smart appliances and network devices, the thing, thing that scares the living daylights out of me is implantables. Uh, a few years ago, my elderly next-door neighbor had a heart attack, and he went to the hospital, and doctors implanted a pacemaker in him. So he had come home, and a few weeks later, he was still feeling a little sluggish. So he went to the doctor again, and the doctor pointed a device at his chest, and I quote, turned his heart up a beat or two. And this terrifies the living daylights out of me. Um, the late Barnaby Jack showed just how terrified, terrifying unsecured implantables could be in his work on remote hacking of implantable insulin pumps. Karen Sandler from the Software Freedom Conservancy has talked about the security of FDA devices at length. If you have ever dealt with FDA devices, a software upgrade is not something that is easily done, and it requires a, quite a bit of process around the upgrade. If we fail to prioritize security within IoT, the consequences could very well have tragic and even deadly results. So let me take my tinfoil hat off for a moment. 
there are ways we can substantially mitigate this risk, especially if you're developing open source based embedded devices. One of the few good things that came out of Heartbleed was it exposed just how underfunded and understaffed parts of our ecosystem are. Core Infrastructure Initiative under the Linux Foundation was created to help address some of these issues by helping to fund critical parts of the Linux ecosystem. More, however, can and should be done. By contributing to the open source community, be it through time or money, we create a situ situation where a rising, tide rises, or a rising tide lifts all boats. We see this in the projects I work on, the Octo Project and Open Embedded, where corporations within the embedded space collaborate on a core set of metadata, a core build platform, and in turn create a community of developers with one goal in mind, to make embedded development as painless as possible. So people who know me in real life know that I'm a bit of an old tech nerd. Uh, one of my favorite devices, and it's one that I still use, weighs about 60 pounds, has 41 tubes. It's an old R390 radio receiver, made about 60 years ago. Along with my old receiver came this thick operating manual, about maybe half an inch thick. Um, came along with a vast amount of schematics, one of them up here. Um, and there's this entire community around the R390A figuring out ways to get around tubes that are no longer made, like the full wave rectifier, um, to keep a device that was made in the 50s still going. Thought, your average refrigerator lasts about 14 to 16 years. The lifespan of Windows XP was 13. I use what really is a false comparison here, though, to make a point. Your device is going to last a lot longer than you're willing to support firmware for it. But just because you're not creating patches for it, not releasing software upgrades, and if in fact end of life it, does not mean people won't still be using your device. So by enabling the community to contribute to your device, manufacturers reduce this risk of ever waking up to the headlines, Foos Corp's end of life device implicated in massive botnet. So what I'm saying is work as openly as possible. If you are developing Linux-based embedded devices, you should already be complying with the GPL. So this shouldn't really be hard. If you are shipping devices with open source software, make it easy for people to rebuild, make it easy people, for people to modify, make it easy for people to create. Create communities around your device so when you do decide to end of life your software, the community that you have helped create can keep this alive. I showed this slide to a friend of mine who was a UX designer, and she got all giddy. I love user experience designers. They are the unsung champions of our world, and smart and develop embedded developers will value their contribution, and not just when it comes to device usage perspective, but also from an upgrade process standpoint. If your user is told to download the firmware, blast it to a USB key, upload it to your device, hit the reset button for 10 seconds, your device is never going to get upgraded. Ever. A UX designer will make the difference between a device that is regularly upgraded versus one that is not. If you create a process that is easy for end users, that enables the end user to keep your device secure with the least amount of headache, your users will thank you and will help mitigate the risk your company is exposed to if you are ever impacted by a CVE. <coughs> the most obvious thing we can do is security auditing. But security auditing that focuses not just on the hardware and the software, but also on the process of upgrading. Assume that every device upstream from your own is compromised in some way. Ask yourself, given the worst case scenario, how would you protect your device from bad actors, both in its stack and its upgrade process? In conclusion, contribute to the open source ecosystem. Create developer communities around your device. Develop upgrade processes assuming the most paranoid worst case scenario. Think like the people you are trying to secure against. And lastly, wait for a major CVE and then go take a, re a security researcher out to lunch. The conversation you get will, from, from it will make it so that you never look at your refrigerator in the same light. <laughs> Contact info. Thanks so much.